preach, okay? I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Realizing You Are Blessed in All Things. Realizing You Are Blessed in All Things, or subtitle, Cupid is Real. Cupid is real. And by the end of that, you, and the message today, you're going to believe me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him for his help and his blessing. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach the word. Lord, we love you and we want to honor you in all things. And we just, we praise you for the precious truths that we have uh, been able to sing and stand on through Jesus Christ. I ask, Lord, that we would understand his blessing upon our life uh, because we've come to know you as Savior. I ask, Lord, that you would take over this morning. Lord, I surrender all to you. Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, speak in these people's hearts and their minds. And let, let uh, your truth come out of my mouth, Lord. I, I want to get out, out of the way, not unto us, but not unto us, but unto thy own self, give glory. And so blessed in Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Has it ever occurred to you that we trust the Lord in so many huge areas of our life concerning our salvation, concerning our eternal soul's destiny, concerning what we are before him and reconciled, concerning his wrath on our hearts. We trust him for such huge things in salvation, and yet we struggle trusting God in the daily practical things. We worry. We fret. We scheme. We obsess as if there was no God leading our way. We forget that putting our faith in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as we have been singing in him alone I love that song. It was like two songs ago or something. Not in me. You know, the verses are just lists of anything that someone could wrongly trust in, perhaps, uh, to think that they have standing with God. I love that. No humble dress, no work, no righteousness of my own, no, no confession, no fervent prayers, Christ and Christ alone. We trust him in the huge areas, but when the daily practical struggles come in life, we tend to be tempted to lose it concerning trust and faith. We wonder how we're going to make it through a day, how we're going to pay a bill, how we're going to deal with the relationship, how we're going to get through this next hurdle. We forget that the moment we put our faith and trust in the work of Jesus Christ as our Savior, that gained us, that gained us much more than a ticket out of hell. It gained us a committed father. It gained us royal status with the king it gained us a god that fully and in every way is for us a shepherd who has pledged himself in a thousand verses or more to guide us to protect us to lead us in the, pl the paths of righteousness to have a plan for us to bring us to an expected end to complete what he began in us etc 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 these are all chunks of bible verses this aspect of faith that is trusting God in the practical things of life as a born-again believer is what we're going to preach today in the life of Abraham. So turn as we continue to preach the book of Genesis, Genesis 24, please. Origins, the study of Genesis, Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. Would you stand, please, as we read the very word of God? These things I read to you are the words of God. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country, unto my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure, or, or maybe the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. But must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? Abraham said unto, them, uh, unto him, Beware that thou 
Bring not my son thither again, or back there again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, that, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath, only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. You may be seated. <coughs> the first verse here, I believe, holds the key really to the entire idea and understanding of growing in faith, trusting God. And you might not see it, you know, as you just read across it, but, you know, there is no word of God that is fluff. Everything that is written in the context of a passage is there for a reason that God has given you to understand something about the passage. And I think this is a key phrase in verse number one. It is the phrase, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So now really understand it. Think about it like if you were reading a textbook or if you're reading a story in a book. Here is this, this phrase that seems to be dangling out there. And I guess you could just give yourself to think that what it means is just the Lord wants us to know that, that uh, in all that stuff that he had, that Abraham had grown wealthy and he, and he had servants. And all of that is true. But why does it appear here? Why does it appear right before the story of how he is sending his servant to go and find his son a wife. Consider that this is written for a purpose. As he sends Eliezer, his oldest servant, his very faithful servant, we've seen him before, to find a wife for Isaac. It's not random like, by the way, Abraham is blessed. That is true, and it's good. I mean, that's part of the meaning. We need to realize, you know, that God just you know, increased Abraham much more financially and these kind of things than he did other people and us as well. But that's really not what this is the setup for. It's not why the Lord told us this right before this story. It is context information that we can probably, pro properly understand what is going on with the servant going and finding the son, a wife. Our passage today is about Abraham's wife, or Abraham's faith to trust God in a practical matter, finding a wife for his son Isaac. It was kind of an important issue, you know, since he was the son of the promised covenant and that all the earth would be blessed, that, they would, that he would be the heir of, of bringing God's people and this great heritage, this many, many multitudes of people as, Mars, as, as more as the, the sand of the seashore or the stars in the sky. It's pretty important when that's the burden on your shoulders that you, you have a wife. That's like a very practical kind of thing. You know, how am I going to bring all these generations, Lord, if you don't give me a wife? The statement, Abraham was blessed in all things, has a specific meaning concerning this. We have seen his life. We have seen the messes. We have seen his failures. We have seen his struggles. God blessing you in all things doesn't just mean, you know, um, if all the raindrops were lemon drops and gum drops, oh, what a world this would be. You know that song? If you grew up watching Barney, unfortunately, you probably know all the words to that song. That's not how it is. You know, life is hard many times, and life was hard for Abraham. And Abraham made multiple failures, multiple sin issues, crazy stuff, you know, taking, you know, an additional wife, all this stuff, you know, this cra crazy stuff. And yet it says here that that he was blessed, the Lord blessed him in all things. What's it mean, blessed in all things then? It means that Abraham had favor with God in every situation, in every day, with every person, in every trial, from the moment that he believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Let me say that another way concerning blessing, because we, we tend to think of it only one way, in the way of getting stuff. And what is going on here is in, it's in the way of God giving Abraham favor and leading and guiding his life and directing every path, even finding a wife for his son. Let me say it in another way, the, the whole God blesses in all things. God is viciously loyal to his own that come to him in salvation through Jesus Christ, which is the only salvation. God is viciously loyal, is viciously for you, is aggressively blessing your life, not that that means, you know, lemon drops and gumdrops. Is aggressively standing with you, being with you, 
Because you have come to his ingre- incredible covenant of grace, his, incre- his incredible relationship of being his child through Jesus. He is for you. He is faithful. He is loyal. He is unshakable. He never forgets you. He has a plan for your life. He has a direction for your life. He is there for you. I don't know how else to say it. I think I've struggled 38 years in my salvation to fully grasp and enjoy this and to act on it. But it is true and it is supported by a multitude of scripture. When you were born into the family of God, that moment that you realized yourself as a a sinner under the wrath of God and deserving of hell, and you cried out to the Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and trusted and believed that someone already had taken God's wrath for you. His name is Jesus Christ. And he had taken all the punishment that was intended for you, that you deserve, upon himself on that cross. And he was dead three days, and then he rose again in victory. That moment that you come into that relationship of trusting Christ, the Lord says that he borns you again. He births you again into his own family and and takes responsibility for you. That is viciously loyal. And frankly, I'm going to just say a weird thing, and it's supported by Scripture. Nothing else matters after that point. As far as the Lord's commitment to you, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God takes full responsibility for you. You're never on your own again. You are blessed in all things, favored. You are are watched over by God. Scripture bears that out even in the worst trials, even in, in your worst failures. I mean, come on, let's let's be honest. I mean, some of the disciples absolutely failed the Lord, and yet the Lord came and found them. God is working all things together for your good, the scripture says. That's what blessed in all things mean. This is verse 1. This is the setup so you understand what's about to happen concerning the practical aspect of getting a daughter-in-law. When your life is over, like Abraham's, it will be said of you in heavenly places that you are blessed by God in all things because you are reconciled to him in Christ Amen. Abraham realized this. He, he realized this, and we know that he realized this because he functioned this way. He walked with God daily, as we have seen. He was a friend of God. And his thinking and his life and his decisions and everything was saturated with the Lord, with understanding how he had been blessed in the Lord. He, you remind, I'll remind you, we have some visitors here as we preach through uh, Genesis. I remind you that he is the Father of, according to the New Testament, of salvation by grace through faith. He believed in the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed in a righteousness outside of himself, and that's how he was saved. And then God walked with him, and he walked with God from that day on. His thinking, his life, his decisions, everything saturated with the Lord. And this confidence and faith in the Lord was in every practical aspect of what is going on in his life and what is going on in this story now that is the setup that's the t you put the ball on now let's whack it okay here we go number one abraham's life faith excuse me led him to make wiser you can say more excellent or godly or best choices let me say that again abraham's faith that is the confidence and the understanding and the realization of god's favor on his life led him to make wiser choices. Look at two and three. It says, And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the the God of heaven and the God of the earth, and thou shalt not take a wife uh, unto me of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. And then he tells him where to find the wife. Lest we be too weirded out by this, I, I think we need to look at these cultural idioms and in, in situations, I'm not just going to glaze over. I mean, the guy, what, what? You know, put your hand under my thigh. Okay, that's a little bit too weird for me. It's a cultural oath of some sort. And depending on what sort that you, what source you look at, you just realize that this was like a promise that was backed up by something. It would be like us, us saying perhaps raise your right hand or like in court, put your hand on the Bible or, or something, you know, s- whatever it is, swearing, promising by something. This in the culture and in the time is what you did. Eliezer was Abraham's trusted servant that had been with him a long, long time. We saw him back in chapter 15, you remember, when Abraham was frustrated because he wasn't, you know, because Sarah wasn't getting pregnant. And he was very frustrated, and he said, he said, Lord, maybe, maybe you should make this Eliezer my servant. Maybe you should make him my heir. 
Okay, so he appeared before in chapter 15. He trusts this guy. I mean, this was his faithful servant. Abraham says, yeah, come on over here, Eliezer. Eliezer. Swear by God that you won't take a wife for my son from the daughters of this land around here. He says, I got, I got a job for you. You got to find a wife for Isaac. Okay, but swear you will not take that wife from Canaan, from this place where we are sojourning, where we are gypsying, where we are living presently. You remember that though this was the promised land, and we look backwards and say, oh, great, the promised land, land flowing with mucha honey, blah, 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 blah. At this point, it was just full of pagans. It was full of Hittites and all kind of ites, and there were idolatry and perversion and paganism of every sort, all right? So, so this wasn't the beautiful Canaan land that sometimes we think about. Abraham wasn't going to run that, the chance of idolatry and paganism being welcomed into perverting his son and his family, knowing that they were God's chosen people. He, he just wasn't going, to run, wasn't going to risk it. The fishing ponds for Isaac, do you know what I mean by fishing ponds? You know, how many of you think you know what I mean by fishing ponds right here? This is where you find your spouse. You know, fishing ponds. Oh, Pastor, I just believe in courting. I believe in just staying in my home and praying. And she will come and knock on the door. No, that's a guy who wants to sell you siding. That's not your wife. <laughs> fishing ponds. The fishing ponds for Isaac were rather scarce. But Abraham made the most godly, wisest choice he could. And he made this choice that was a pretty big undertaking because of his faith in the Lord that he was guiding every day of his life. That he was guiding every situation of his life because he was under his grace. You remember he had heard uh, back in the end of chapter 22 about his family back in Mesopotamia. And how they were doing. And they seemed to be prospering. And so he knew about them. And that was over 500 miles away. Over five. Okay, listen. This guy doesn't have, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, whatever car you drive. This guy's not, he's not going to jump in his station wagon. Hey, Eliezer, jump in the station wagon and go get this. No, this is 500 miles of a journey on beast or foot or whatever. But he was willing to do it, and Abraham insisted that it be done this way because it was the best choice of faith, finding a wife for Isaac. It was the most godly decision, the most excellent decision of what the Lord would want. Choosing a wife from his own extended people meant that he was going to a place of loyalty, of understanding. It meant that she would be much more likely to be a Jehovah follower, Isaac's God. And, and we're going to see that in following passages in a different sermon by the way young adults can I ask you something singles of any age where are you fishing where, where are you fishing where you look for a spouse will have a great impact on what your marriage will be like what your family will be like look for a spouse please I mean, it's just, I, I feel silly saying this, but look for a, a spouse, please, in Christian circles. And I don't even want to just say Christian circles, like, you know, three-quarters of America says that they're Christians. I'm talking about committed believers who have the fruit of the Lord in them. So, that's right. It matters, it hugely matters. When you're talking about over a 50% divorce rate among church, among Christians... It really matters if they are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look for fishing among God's people. Not in some club or random party or some secular dating service. That app, that online app probably can't tell you exactly what you need to know about this woman of God. Yeah, but they've checked all the right things and I have slides that Fish in the best ponds. Fish in the best ponds. I'm pretty sure God is dependable if that's what he wants for your life. Did you hear what I said? I'm pretty sure that God can be dependable if that, it, I know it doesn't all work out like, you know, per, some situation in, in here. Amy and I worked out, for, I mean, I just walked up and says, is you is or is you ain't my baby? She says, I is and we was. 
I mean, that was, I know it doesn't always work out like that. But fish in the best ponds. This is frankly why I recommend for young people, for Christian young people, that you go to Christian university because there's just a lot of fish there. All right? And I know it doesn't work out that way and it's not God's will for everyone. I understand. It's just a lot of fish there. Of course, what do I know? You know, both of my oldest are dating people that didn't come from their Christian college. So, I mean, wh- I mean what do I know? But I'm just saying, if you want to get good fish, you've got to fish in the best ponds. Later in the story, uh, Abraham's family, that family from Mesopotamia, we find out that when, the, when Eliezer gets there, this is going to be a future week, when Eliezer gets there, guess what? They're Jehovah worshipers. They're followers. They speak the name, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your translation. But Jehovah, they follow Jehovah. They seem to respect that the Lord, this, this servant, is coming to find a, a, a follower of Jehovah. They seem to be Jehovah followers, if you've been here for the whole series, clear from the days of Shem. You know, that's Abraham's son, or excuse me, Noah's son, as they went to different parts of the world. This, this group seems to be still followers of the Lord God, and they can track it right back to Adam, Abraham's servant. He sent his servant over 500 miles to find a daughter-in-law because his faith in the Lord that drove him made him make hard choices sometimes. And the fact that he walked with the Lord and trusted the Lord for every decision of his life caused him sometimes not to go the easy route and not to go the popular route that the world does or how they would choose you know, a daughter-in-law or they would choose a spouse, things like that. It drove him to make godly choices, wiser life choices than just doing what was easiest for his family. I'm sure there's someone out there in Hittites and the Jebusites and all the Ittites that would have been, okay, she's pretty, she doesn't do drugs. I don't know. You know, it seems like that's the, the farthest extent sometimes that our young people, farthest extent down. Oh, yeah, she, yeah, Dad, she's great. She goes to church. She doesn't do drugs. She hasn't been in prison lately. <laughs> Obviously, in this culture, parents were much more than just involved in the relationships of their children. We see that here in other places. They were responsible to make these marriages, to cha- trade the goats and all that kind of stuff. Abraham chose what he believed was the most godly choice because of his faith driving him. His faith in the Lord's direction of his life. His faith in the Lord's hand on his life. Let me first comment on the obvious, okay? Parents and children, it is still a great move, he said, as he has a lot invested in this. It is still a great move to respect the wisdom and the perspective of your parents when choosing a husband and wife. Amen? Yes? Amen? Whitmer children? Amen. Amen. Father often does know best. And only people who ever watch black and white television even knows what I'm talking about. Mother is often correct in her character assessment of a potential mate. Mother often knows best. I have to tell you a story because it's my obligation to do it that I don't want to tell, tell. Okay, so there was this girl. I was a senior, I guess, in high school or junior or senior. And this girl, she was the pastor's daughter, you know. They're always perfect, right? So I was dating her. I guarantee you if I had married her, I would not be standing. I guarantee you I would not be standing here. Some of you say, oh, I wish you would have wish you married her. <laughs> so I thought I'd bring her home to meet Mama. It took five minutes for my mother to recognize what that floozy really was. <laughs> and I had, known, I had known a girl for years. We didn't make it out of the foyer of my house. We walked in, and this floozy started talking, and I saw it in my mother's eyes, and I felt it in my own heart. It was like my mother was a, a, a God-sent filter for me to see things clearly. Now, that's not always the case. It's just like 99.9% of the time. You talk about an uncomfortable evening. So, you know, we made it out of the foyer, and I knew it was on like Donkey Kong. And, and so this girl, I got it written in my notes. I'm not going to say her because my wife might throw a hymn book at me. 
she went over into the living room, my parents' home, and I was like in the kitchen with my mother. I could see it in my mother's eyes. And she said something like, that girl is so fake. The girl's in my house right there. And so, you know, when I go back to talk to the girl this evening, we had other company as well. She could tell, the girl could tell there's something wrong and whatever. And I was like, you know, whatever, 18 years old. So I told her what was wrong. (laughs) I told her what my mother thought of her. And then I probably put something on the end like, but it'll be okay. (laughs) So about 10 minutes after that, this girl's asking me to take her home. I want to tell you something about that girl. Several years ago, that get girl married, uh, well, that's not the right grammar. So after college, she went to Bob Jones. You know, that tells you something. After college, she married a girl, or married a guy, guy that I knew. I've messed this way up. She, it wasn't long after that. She had a couple kids, whatever. And her husband walked in the kitchen, and she was in the arms of another man. Her husband owned a company, and his vice president, his, they were both employed, his wife and the vice president, and they would go on business trips, and I know, I know you can figure it all out. I say this only to tell the singles here, allow your parents' opinion to mean something. And I say that to my own children. Allow your parents' opinion to mean something. Parents, though we are not in Abraham's culture to arrange marriages, I do believe it is our responsibility to be very involved for our children's sake. And oh, how many divorces could have been avoided if mom and dad would have really been involved in their young adult child's decision, if, if it wouldn't have been that tension that happens when the child turns 21, 22, 23, that they know better than their parents or whatever, if they just listen a little bit. I know our noses can't get up in, up in all of their business at every moment, but please, this one's a big one. Put away the, the independence for a moment. Listen to your mother. Listen to your father a moment. Just allow us to say something for a moment, please. But this point is much broader than that, isn't it? Than picking a mate, what I'm talking about here in this first point. It is about your faith and trust in the Lord causing you to make decisions based on what the Lord wants, not on what you want. It is about looking at the different aspects of your life, the priorities, the time, the family choices, your relationship choices now, and making decisions based on what he wants. Realize all that God has blessed you in and make your choices based on what the Lord wants, trusting him with the outcome. Your faith in knowing his hand upon you as a child of God, directing your life in every choice. So I say that because, you know, Abraham, how does Abraham know what's going to happen? Okay, I don't think there's anything in Scripture that reveals that God told him exactly to do this. He is just making these wise choices based on walking with God and, and seeing God's hand upon his life. Number two, here we go. Abraham's faith led him to go, uh, let it, to let go of the past and embrace God's will for his future. Abraham's faith led him to let go of the past and embrace God's will for his future. Verse 6 and seven. Let's look at it, please. And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed while I give this land, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. The point is Abraham's faith led him to let go of the past and to embrace God's will for his future. So did Abraham consider his past? And say, man, I failed you, Lord, all these times. You know, I can't trust you for the future. I've 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 failed you these different times in my life and in my marriage. You know, with Sarah and all of this stuff. So I don't know if you'll be faithful to me now. No, he didn't. Uh, I came a long way, Lord, and I came from that Mesopotamia area. And and so what I have to do now is based on what I did then. No, he didn't. He let go of the past 
And he embraced God's will for his future. Two times, verse uh, 6 and verse 8, Abraham insists that Eliezer never take his son back to Mesopotamia. He's belligerent about what is going on here. Isaac had been reared in Abraham's encampment with Abraham's rules and his culture and his faith and walking with God every day and his practice, his habits, his traditions. It was very, very different from the land of the Hittites where he dwelled, the people of Canaan. It was, it was much, much more like his kindred, how they lived life back in Mesopotamia. I think what's going on in, in Abraham's mind is that he knew that if Isaac would go back there, if this servant would take, his, take Isaac back there, and seeing a living situation and, and cities and encampments, whatever, that was so close to how Abraham, being the only way, the only people who lived that way in Canaan, I think, I think he, he thought he was running a risk that Isaac might just want to stay. Might just want to make his home there among his kindred, people that were loyal to him, people that worshiped the same way. You say, what's wrong with that, pastor? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, except it just flat out wasn't God's will. And we don't even have to question that at all. God had given the family Canaan land as a possession. He had said very clearly, this is your new land. You're going to dwell there. You're going to become a great people. I'm going to give you every square inch of the land. As the promised land, it was Isaac's future forever. It's exactly what the Lord wanted for his life. Abraham had come a long way geographically, but even more spiritually. And he wasn't looking back. God's path before him trumped anything that was behind him. And by the way, it could be that it would have been easier for Isaac if he would have gone and lived in Mesopotamia. But what's that to you? You dwell where the Lord wants you. It may have been that he had prospered greatly and that Jehovah was easier to worship back in Mesopotamia. What's that to you? You've got to do what God's will is for you right now, Christian. You've got to do what the Lord wants you to do now and in the future, not looking over your shoulder to what, how good it was in the past or some different direction of life. Have you come to the point in your Christian life that you can honestly say in faith, that follows God, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. No regrets, no remorse, no desire to live the life that God called me out of, no desire to return to the immature person that I used to be, no intention of returning to the sin that I once lived for, no desire to return to the land that I left. There's two things in that. Number one is the salvation decision. I don't like to say decision. That's, that's a, not a, the, really the right word. When the Holy Spirit moves on your heart and you know that you need Christ as your Savior and you are born again, you, you're, you decide, you, you're following Jesus, no turning back. You can't look over your shoulder to the life that you used to have or to the life that you could have had that was outside the Lord. That's craziness. What, what the Lord gave you is so much better than where you came from. Amen? Yes? I look at some of you, I know some of your testimonies. I'm going to call on you. But there's another aspect to this, and that is the will of God leading you till the day you die. I love West Virginia. Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah River. Life is old there. I won't keep going. Because then I'd eventually run into a misty taste of moonshine, teardrop in her eye, and I'm just not going to. Such a controversial issue, drinking. The Lord didn't keep me in West Virginia. He brought me to Delaware. I'm so thankful. I can't look back over my shoulder. This isn't really a good illustration because every time I go back to West Virginia, I feel like I need to save the people and bring them to the East Coast out of their poverty and their coal mines. Okay, I, I do. I feel like I, listen, you know what? There are dentists in Delaware. orthopedic surgeons for the you know, one leg for a longer leg living on a mountain some of you don't even know all these jokes the Lord didn't leave my family in Philly northeast Philly at Ben Salem although there were tears the Lord didn't leave you wherever you were 10 years ago he, he brought you here wherever here is 
And he don't want you to look back at the good old days or what it could have been. He wants you to have joy in where he has you right now and looking forward with expectation in faith that he's going to lead you every day till the day you die or he comes in the rapture. I have a feeling that some people look back over their shoulder the way Abraham refused to. Don't you dare take my son back there. Don't you dare. Our future is here and beyond. It's not back there. By the way, what God had for you 10 years ago is not what he has for you 10 years from now. I don't like change. How many of you are with me? You just hate th- when things change. You hate that? I don't, like, I don't like when companies change their logos and, and when colors change. And Like, I always like the old Coke. Don't get me to some new Coke. Don't, don't change. What's wrong with the old formula? Why would you even think about that? What, are you crazy? You know what I'm saying? We can't look back. God's with us right now. God has a future for us that's before us. It doesn't involve what's behind us. God had told Abraham his will for his family, and that was Canaan. So he could absolutely tell his servant in great faith and trust in the Lord what was coming. Don't you dare go back. You go there, find a wife. Don't you take my son back there. Do you think as we follow God's will in our lives that sometimes we're a, bit, a little bit faithless and we look back and we say, I wish for the, well, the past days in my life. I wish for the good old days before blank and blank happened in my life. Do you know blank and blank happened in your life because the Lord wanted it to and allowed it? Can I tell you that? And I say that knowing some of your stories and, and knowing my own story and some of the things that I just wish never happened. But you gotta understand the Lord is for you. His grace, his favor, he's blessing you in all things, like verse one. This is where the Lord wants me. You need to say in your life. How are you gonna say that I wish for the good old days when you follow God's will to hear in your life right now? No, if we are following God's will day by day like Abraham, we can boldly say with confidence, this is where God wants me. I will be excited about that until he directs my family somewhere else. I don't long for where I came from. The way ahead is better than the path behind me. God is for me. He is blessing me in all things in my life because of Jesus Christ. I have no interest in going back to Mesopotamia. No interest at all. Churches are like this as well. Let me just throw this out at you. We can't stall or hibernate looking over our shoulder at the good old days. Do you understand that? And stuff happens. And stuff happens that shouldn't happen. We can't look back when so-and-so was here or when so-and-so or when Pastor Whitmer was doing this or when we were back at the, at the, uh, the warehouse, is that what we called it, warehouse building, or we had lawn chairs and things like that. Some, some of you are saying, why would you ever long for lawn chairs? Oh, well, those were happy days. What the Lord has for lighthouse is not behind us. It's before us, amen? I mean, unless you think God's walked, walked away? No. The Lord has great plans for his church. He said, I will build my church. It's a promise. And so I'm just taking him at his word. Abraham took God at his word that God would lead him in all things. He said, great, let's go get a wife for Isaac. But this forward view, and let me just say this, all right? I'll get, get in trouble with some of you. Some of you look back to 1960 whatever, the good old days in the church when God was doing this and big bus routes and things and this was, the church was, you can't look back here, you can't, all right? We can't stall looking back at the past. You know, God, do you know that the kingdom of God is greater now than it was in 1970? He says he's going to grow his kingdom like from a, a little seed to a great tree. He's growing his kingdom. He's increasing his church. He is blessing his church. Don't look for it. Don't be a Debbie Downer and look backwards. Look forwards. Amen. Thank you. But this forward view to embrace God's future is a, if for your life is a, a faith issue for you. It's whether you're going to believe it, this or not. All the promises of God. Quote a few here in a minute. You can't go back to Mesopotamia when God has given you Canaan. And who would want to? Number three. Abraham's faith led him to trust the Lord implicitly. Implicitly. Especially in the practical daily areas 
of life. Look at verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, okay, he, he blessed me there, he guided me, and from the land of my kindred, he guided me there, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, unto thy seed, well, I'll give this land. Okay, so he's named four things, how the Lord has guided him all the way. Yeah? Yeah, you see that? Okay, now look, at here it comes. He shall send his angel before me. Based on God's faithfulness to him in the past, he absolutely knew that the Lord would direct him in the future. He will send his angel before me, or before thee, excuse me, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. In the point, look at the screen, the word implicitly there, looking for the right word to explain what verse 7 means. The word implicitly in the point is an interesting word. According to the dictionary, it means without qualification, absolutely, totally, completely. In fact, I, I really had to chuckle. You can do this, but don't do it right during the service, please. You can. You can do this. You can look up the word on dictionary.com and the illustration sentence that it gives down below, you know, it says what it means and it gives synonyms or whatever and uses it in a sentence. The sentence that it uses for the word implicit on dictionary.com means, an Im- or says, it says an implicit faith in God. Uh, well, that'll work. Even dictionary.com realizes that you should trust God in every area of your life without qualification, and that's the point I'm saying here. We trust him for this huge thing, salvation, and then we're not sure if he's going to be with us when we go away and do this big thing, or when we have this great responsibility, or when we have to pay this bill, or when we have to find a wife, or a husband, or whatever. Without qualification, absolutely, totally, completely, in all the big and little areas, like my introduction, it's so odd that you know we're we're trusting for an eternal soul, but, but then some letter that comes in the mail scares us to death. Or when physical health happens. Some of you have been through all kinds of stuff this last year. Through, through, you just, I think you're supposed to listen to me. <laughs> You've been through all kinds of stuff this year. You've been through cancer and the loss of loved ones and, and, and junk and heart problems and issues and medical things of all time. Listen, you've trusted him with your soul. You can trust him with your body. You trust him with your soul. You can trust him with everything in your life. Your relationships and your money. I already told you a million times, God, God, I don't think God respects the, uh, the due dates on my bills. But he, he has been faithful and taking care of it. And praise God, I have excellent credit. Amen. See, I just told you something I shouldn't tell you. But I do. You need a loan? <laughs> God has been faithful to us. You can trust him with your career. And even finding a mate. Wait a minute, that's our story. Consider what Abraham is saying. In verse 7, he shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son. Listen, I don't believe in Jack Frost, I don't believe in Easter Bunny, but I do believe in Cupid from this verse. He's right there in verse 7. It's the angel of love, the love angel. Maybe some of you should start praying, Lord, send the love angel my way. It's a val- Do you laugh? That's a valid thing to pray. That's Abraham, you know, that's what he's saying. Had God told Abraham about Cupid? I don't think so. Probably not. It's just the implicit faith that Abraham had in the Lord that he believes in all areas of his life, including finding a wife for his son, that God will work. Now, is this this a verse that our singles should claim, you know, that, okay, this is for me? No, Abraham had a one-up in his faith on this because, you know, Isaac was the chosen heir for all the generations, so he had to have a wife. So he, he based his faith on some exact word of God. You know, he, he didn't, it wasn't name it and claim it. You know, he knew that God was going to give him a wife. He moved forward in confidence. But he, it is kind of funny about this angel, this Cupid. He believed implicitly the Lord would, would work on all areas of life, including finding Isaac a wife, that God is working, God will work, God will make a way, God does have a plan, God is going to work for him, God will provide. Again, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Oh, people of God, can we learn this? Will we believe this? May we trust God in all the practical areas of our lives because he has committed himself to us in Jesus Christ? Can we, will we implicitly trust him in all the little areas? Psalm 32, 8 makes this promise. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye, the Lord says. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, one that we know so well. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he, what's the next word? Yell that. 
He shall direct thy paths. It's a, you know, he's going to do it. It's a promise. All right, Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Listen, I, I used to pray this way as a college student. Lord, I'll be the car, but you be the driver. You turn that wheel in my life. You've got to turn that wheel in my life. You, you, it's your job to walk. It's God's job to turn your feet the way you should go. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he, the Lord, delighteth in his, the believer's way. God promise, God's promises of faithfulness and involvement in our lives is sure. We must realize this. It's not a make or break. Oh, Lord, I didn't, I didn't have my devotions uh, the way that I should last week, so are you going to be committed to me now? No, come on, get out of that immature thinking. The Lord has committed himself to you. He's your Abba Father every day when you fail him, when you don't fail him. When you're faithful, when you're not faithful. He is always faithful to you. He's committed himself. That's what grace is about. Not something you can live up to. We can't live up to God. That's why we needed Jesus in the first place. He's faithful. We must realize that. We must act on these truths of his faithfulness. In great faith and decisions and priorities. The way Abraham did. And above all things, we must not doubt that God is with us and directing us. Because frankly... Doubting God that God is with you or not makes the Lord very upset. The Bible calls it tempting or testing. Another way to say that is challenging God. And by upset, I mean it's like a father and a, a son having a son that won't trust him. Although he's super committed to his son. Do you remember in Exodus 17 that Israel had come out of Egypt and Moses had, Moses had led them to a, a place called Rephidim, where there wasn't enough water for them to drink. Or at least they didn't think there was. It wasn't in abundance. The people began complaining and, and getting upset at Moses and began doubting God. They quarreled with Moses about their situation. And you remember what happened. Moses was so upset that he smote the rock and water came out. And then he rebuked the people. Exodus 17, 7 says it this way, and he called the name of the place Masa, which means tempting, tempting the Lord. They did. And Meribah, which means quarreling, because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, now look what they said. This, is, this, this phrase has had a huge impact on my life. They said this, is the Lord among us or not? They questioned the Lord's presence in their life. And the Bible calls that everything from chiding to quarreling, you know, to tempting the Lord, challenging the Lord. And it greatly saddens the heart of God when you and I do that. When we wonder if he's there or not, when things are rough, or when you're feeling lonely, or when depression has hit you, and anxiety, and you're having an anxiety attack. Don't question the promises of the Lord. Don't Question the loyalty of the Lord. Don't question his vicious commitment to you. Folks, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, God has blessed you in all things. He has his hand in every little thing in your life. Romans 8 says all things work together for good in a context which is rough things, suffering things, suffering. He is behind you. He's in front of you. He has his hand on you. He's got you covered, Psalm 139 says. And as I've reminded you so many times, before about the Lord giving you Jesus in this aspect. Consider this verse, Romans 8. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now this incredible verse. He that spared not his own son. That means he didn't, he didn't keep his own precious possession, his son from you. But delivered him up for us all on the cross. How shall he not with him, with Jesus also, freely give us all things but it's talking about things that are good for you and things that are his glory excuse me <coughs> that means if god gave you the entire farm in jesus christ he gave you the greatest thing surely he will give you a few good chickens in every other aspect god has his hand on your life god is with you don't you dare let yourself Think as faithless Israel, is the Lord with us or among us or not? 
I confess to you that that demon thought has flown through my head many times. I rebuke it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because it mocks the word of God and God's promises to me. It mocks God's faithfulness to me and where he has brought me these good 48 years. And it, it just mocks what the Lord thinks towards you, his precious children. Don't ever say, is the Lord with me or not? Believe that he's both with you He's leading and guiding you all the way in your family. He's blessing you in all things. Let your faith then direct your steps in confidence to make decisions and to go forward, not looking back. Would you bow your heads, please, this morning?